Thank you, Mallory. Well, good morning. It is good to worship with you. It is good to look into God's Word and peer into His insights for us. If you have your Bibles, would you open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you don't, uh, if you're going to use one of the Bibles uh, in the seat in front of you, it's page 927. We are working our way through this wonderful book of First Thessalonians, and we have been very encouraged and through the first chapter of how glorious the gospel of Christ is, how absolutely important it is that that be the focus of ministry. And as we move into uh, chapter 2, we're going to gain a lot of insight into ministry. Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians, and then how this can encourage us in our own personal ministries. So we're in chapter 2. If you would stand with me, we're going to read through the first eight verses. Starting with verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or for others, from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Let's pray. Father, as we encounter this passage, this letter written by Paul to the Thessalonica, church at Thessalonica, we pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to see the beautiful things that you have for us. May we be encouraged. May we be in, uh, challenged. May we be motivated to follow you with our whole hearts in the way that you show us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it has been one year and two weeks since I was installed as the lead pastor here at Calvary Crossroads. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Praise God. He is doing a work within me. He's doing a work within you, within us, uh, to accomplish his task, his, his purposes. And uh, I am, I'm just ecstatic that you haven't thrown me out yet. <laughs> The Lord is good. The Lord is good. You know, when uh, the elders were considering a new pastor, what should we be looking for? And we, we you know, talked to a lot of people. We prayed about uh, who this person would be and, and what they should uh, have as part of their characteristics. Well, some churches look for the perfect pastor. The perfect pastor. So what would it be to be this perfect pastor? <laughs> so here's what the perfect pastor is when you're putting out uh, an inquiry. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> he condemns sin roundly, but he never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the church janitor. 
The perfect pastor makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, reads good books, and donates $30 a week to the church. The perfect pastor is 29 years old with 40 years of experience. Above all, he's handsome. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and he spends most of his time with senior citizens. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to the church. He makes 15 home visits a day and is always in his office to be handy when needed. The perfect pastor always has time for for the church council and all its committees. He never misses any of the meetings of of the church organization, and he's always busy evangelizing the unchurched. It's the perfect pastor. Well, I tell you. To quote the sage of the 60s, Bob Dylan, it ain't me, babe. It ain't me you're looking for. Nope. Uh, Nobody is going to fulfill these expectations or serve perfectly. We got to understand that, don't we? That we're all imperfect people. We're limited by this human skin that we're in. Uh, Our our frailties, our bents, our, our preferences. We're all limited by these things. Ministry. In the ministry, we see this happening all the time. Whether a pastor or whether sitting in the pew. You know your frailties. You know your limitations. You know, we refer to the uh, passage in in Matthew chapter 20, uh, verse 28, when we were having communion, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. His purpose was to serve. And what a radical thought that is, that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of all would serve. Not only serve, but to serve us. That's a crazy thought. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter writes, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God gives you gifts, abilities. Use those to serve one another. That word serve, that word serve, diakoneo, deacon, to serve, to give of your resources to help another, to pay pay attention to another's needs and serve them. That's not only what the Lord did, but he left us an example that that's what we're to be about. Oh, we look at our, uh, our uh, discipleship process. We talk about this all the time. There's a reason. So it gets drilled into our heads. As we're growing, what are we supposed to do? Connect, grow, serve, and reach. Greneco, serve. That's huge. That's part of the normal process of life for the believer. Just like breathing in and out, we receive from the Lord, then we give out in service. Our main point for today as we look at this passage is that as God calls each believer to serve one another, we should focus on God's priorities. Serving Serving is not up to the servant as to where they're to surf. You ever thought of that, that? The master tells the servant where to serve. And so we have these ideas that, of what I should be doing, but God has his 
idea of what we should be doing, and we should be attuned to his priorities for us. So we're going to learn a little bit about that this this, uh, morning. I call this the mechanics of ministry. Why? Because these are some of the ways that we will serve or some of the things that we should be attuned to, the priorities that we should have. And we're looking at Paul and his experience with the Thessalonica, I can't say Thessalonica church, you know, of the church at Thessalonica. That's why we have water up here. I like that's really going to help. The church at Thessalonica. <clears throat> We're going to observe Paul and then gain insight as to how we can serve better. So <clears throat> the first point we're going to find here in verses 1 and 2 is the ministry's mission is maturity. The ministry's mission is maturity. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. And focusing on that phrase, our coming to you was not in vain. Coming to that area of Thessalonica, the ministry that he had, remember, it was only just over two weeks or maybe up to close to four weeks. He, it says specifically he was there three Sabbaths. That's three Saturdays. So that's not a long time to establish a church. And he's saying it wasn't in vain. If you turn that around, you could look at it saying it was fruitful. It was fruitful. And that's our our point that we want to see here. It wasn't a failure, but there was good things that came out of that. Now, as we study the New Testament, as we study the Old Testament too, um, fruit is something that's spoken of often. Uh, fruit would be that which grows out of a tree, a plant, that is good for something. Okay, It's actually to reproduce that plant. And so fruit is um, something that, that uh, the Lord picked up. <laughs> Obviously, he created it, right? Um, and in, in a parable, he talks about a sower, the seed, and uh, then he gives uh, an, uh, an explanation of uh, that parable. Very few parables he actually explained, but he did explain this one. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 23, Jesus says, And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. When we start diving into this, what is the seed that's being spread out, that's being uh, uh, tossed onto the soils? The seed is the word of the kingdom. And Jesus explains this, the word of the kingdom. And it's kind of generic there, the the, the word of the kingdom of what God is doing amongst men and women across the face of the earth. Uh, The word of the kingdom. And then fruit would come from that as it, the seed falls onto good uh, uh, soil that's very fertile, what's going to happen? That sp- seed is going to sprout forth and produce as it matures fruit. What is fruit in this parable? It's the behavior that is beneficial to God's intent. God has an intent for it. It springs up and it's ready to go. So what we see is fruit is expected in the life of the believer. Now, as you have believed in Christ, there is fruit that is to come out of your life. You are not to be a plant that just grows up and cannot produce fruit. God has designed you to produce fruit in your life. We need to keep that in mind. And so... The thing, how does that happen? How does God uh, bring about this? Well, if we go to to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, 
Paul writes to the church there at Ephesus, and he, speaking of Jesus, gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So God gave certain gifted people to the church to raise up, and you see the words highlighted there, to equip the church, to equip, to give them the tools necessary to do what? To do the work of the ministry. And saints, by the way, are you. They're me. God has made us those holy ones. In fact, the beginning of Ephesians talks about it's addressed to the saints. And so he addressed this to that church. It is addressed to us. We are the saints of God, the holy ones of God. And we are to be equipped for what? The work of the ministry. Jim, I thought that's what we paid you for. Uh Uh-uh. My job, I'm a shepherd and a teacher. I'm a pastor. And my job is to help get you ready to do the work of the ministry. Think about this. If it were just up to me to do the work of the ministry, and I'm not a perfect pastor like we just heard about, I... I'm not going to be able to do everything that's needed to cause a church to flourish. My job is I'm part of the process to feed you, to equip you, to get you into the word, to connect, grow, to grow so that you then can serve. Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing there. And it's building up the body. My job, as well as the other elders and pastors here, is to equip you so that you can go out. Look at this room. We've got 130, 40 people in this room. Do you think you can do a much more effective job at evangelizing, impacting the world around us than one person? Absolutely. So this is a joint effort, and we are the body of Christ. We are many members. We all have different gifts, abilities, talents that the Lord wants to employ, to use, to bring about his purposes here on this, uh, on this planet here. And so sometimes, sometimes we don't see that growth happening quickly. I mean, it's just the way it is. But as we keep exposing ourselves to the good teaching of the word, as we start opening up our lives and saying, God, here am I, use me, and we start stripping away the things that hinder us from following the Lord, he uses us, and then we see that fruit happening. The... The next thing that we see here, it's fruitful, but it's also, the ministry is focused. Focused. Look look, look what Paul says here in uh, verse 2. That we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. To speak boldly the gospel of God. Paul was laser focused in his ministry. Uh, he, he wrote to the uh, church at Corinth. He said, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Remember, we talked about the gospel of Christ. It is not a difficult concept to share with another person, but it is difficult to stay on focus. Because oftentimes, we will start shifting on other things, other desires, other passions that we might have. Some of them are good and godly, but some of them are just downright fleshly. There should be no mission creep in our ministry. You say mission creep, what's that? It's a gradual shift in uh, objectives during the course of a military campaign. You start off a campaign, a mission, uh, with one purpose, and then after time, 
you start expanding it to other things and you lose the intensity, you lose the ability to, to, um, to reach your objective and become effective in the ministry. So Paul stayed very effective, and he did it with boldness. Boldness in what? His own abilities to minister? Not at all. What does it say? In God. His boldness was in God. And that's where our confidence must be. That's why we stick with the gospel. That's why we stick with the word. We learn who God is, what God wants to accomplish in this world. And then our boldness is in him because we see him moving not only in our lives, in the fellowship's life, and how he can work in the lives of the unbelievers around us. It is also fought against. Yeah. Notice where he says, I suffered and have been shamefully treated there in verse in verse 2. Paul indeed had suffered. If you read in uh, Acts chapter 16, where Paul goes uh, into this town of Philippi, a Roman colony, this colony had a very little uh, amount of, uh, of Jewish influence there. In fact, they didn't have probably 10 uh, Jews there Jewish men because there was no synagogue. And so they met by the river. And he got some converts in time, but he was eventually uh, imprisoned because he, <laughs> he had uh, gotten irritated at this little slave girl who was possessed by a demon who kept saying, this is, this, is, this is a man of God, you need to listen to him. He has the way of salvation. And Paul finally said, get out of that girl. And the demon was expelled. And the owner of the slave girl got upset because his, uh, he was gaining an income because that girl could tell for- fortunes through the power of that demon. And so uh, Paul uh, was taken, Paul and Silas were both taken to the magistrate. They were beaten with rods. That was a, a group of rods tied together and beaten. That was a Roman way of... of um, of uh, uh, bringing about, uh, uh, a, not a persecution, but a, um, I lost the word. Help me. What? Compliance. Compliance. Yeah, that, okay, how about, how about just beating them? Okay, yeah. Um, and to get them to stop. Just to get them to stop. And so uh, then he was thrown, he and Silas were both thrown in prison, in stocks, overnight, God miraculously freed him. The Roman, uh, the Roman uh, jailer got saved. And then the next morning, the magistrates tried to realize that Paul was actually a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen was never allowed to be beaten like that. And should have had, uh, because they had rights and privileges due to Roman citizens, which other people in the empire wouldn't have uh, been afforded. And so uh, Paul suffered. He was basically run out of town and went, uh, and you can see on the map behind you, uh, or behind me, um, that uh, Philippi, there uh, was that city, the Roman colony. He went to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was about 100 miles away from Philippi. Uh, Several days' journey. Goes into Philippi. And he had, uh, he uh, experienced persecution there. And, uh, you know, in, um, I'm just going to say in in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes about some of the things that he experienced in his life, this is over time, uh, that he had been beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times, he said, I received from the Jews 39 lashes. That would have ripped his back apart. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's the Roman treatment. Once I was stoned. Not the current day meaning. 
Three times I was shipwrecked, and a night and a day I have spent in the deep. This is the type of stuff that Paul went through in his life as he shared the gospel with people who did not know the Lord. This guy had the mindset of ministry. I'm going to serve. I am going to fulfill what God has, uh, the calling that God has placed on my life. This is Paul. Now he gets to Thessalonica. And you see there, it was in the midst of much conflict. Turn with me. Keep your finger here. Turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. This is the account of Paul in Thessalonica. Acts 17. Starting with verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. You notice how he stayed laser focused on the gospel. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men whom you, uh, who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Oh, would I hope that that would be said of Calvary Crossroads. That we've turned the world upside down. And truly it would be right side up that we would be turning it, wouldn't we? By sharing the gospel, by making an impact in the community. May God do that with us. And Jason, verse 17, has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. That's 30 miles down the road. And when they had arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Oh, they're going to start it again. Yeah. And then we find out later on that Jews from Thessalonica had made the trip to Berea and started stirring up the crowd there in, in Berea. And so Paul had to leave, and he went farther south. And if you were to go back, uh, could you go back one slide to the map? You can see Corinth. He makes his way down to Corinth, and there... Uh, from Corinth, he writes the letter of 1 Thessalonians back to the church because he had received Timothy and Silas and they'd given him the, the up-to-date uh, information about the church. And so here's the, the reason why uh, 1 Thessalonians was written. So there was a lot, a lot of conflict that Paul encountered in his ministry. Should we think that that would not happen to us as we start reaching out, impacting the community for the Lord? You know, far too often or far too long, we have enjoyed uh, acceptance by our society, haven't we? Uh, being a Christian was like no big deal. You can be a Christian, you can do what you want to do. But the time is coming, I believe the time is here, where we will be persecuted because of our beliefs. It's already happening across the world. Well, now what's happening is we're getting canceled. Uh, we're getting limited on what we can post online. But that's not the real thing. That's not persecution. That's irritation. And... 
I'll go ahead and say this. Make sure that if you receive persecution, that you're getting persecuted because of the gospel of Christ and not because you're just being an irritant, because you're posting things that, that are just trying to start a fight. No, 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 no. Let it be the gospel of Christ. Let it be your character as you have grown in Christ that is offending people. Not that we want to offend people. If at all possible, be at peace with all men. But it ought to be the gospel. So the second major point that we're going, going to see here in 1 Thessalonians is that the ministry's motive is genuine. We saw that the mission is maturity. Now the motive is genuine. It's, it's the real deal. Uh, back in uh, chapter 1, verse 5, uh, Paul writes, you know what kind of men we proved to be. You know what kind. You saw us. We were among you. We were genuine people. Well, we saw that Paul going into Philippi, Paul going into Thessalonica, his past uh, missionary journeys, he got a lot of uh, resistance and conflict, persecution, beaten. And that happened from unbelievers. What we see here is really from believers. And so the lesson we would want to learn in these next few verses is be aware that there may be backlash from believers. Be aware of that. Backlash. Starting with verse 3. And our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made, uh, he, we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Six things. There are six things that he brings up here that seem to be an answer to how the Thessalonians, some of them, were questioning Paul's validity in ministry. You see, you see there in verse 3, impurity or error, impurity, or any attempt to deceive. And then you go down to verse 5, flattery or greed, a pretext for greed. And then verse 6, seeking glory. These are the things that Paul was being accused of. And you can even see that throughout the rest of the writings of Paul, that he did have to address these things. The church at Corinth, was addressed, he had to address and defend his apostleship uh, to them. And those who start serving the Lord, those who are in ministry, it's going to be you, it's going to be me, it's going to be us together. We're going to often be misunderstood, we're going to be resisted, and we're going to be challenged by those of us in the body. Be aware of that. Now, I know this is kind of a negative thing to say, but it happens. It happens. Uh, there was one thing that a pastor friend of mine uh, used to say, sheep bite. <laughs> Just get ready for it. Sheep bite, you know? And we're all human. We all come from these different backgrounds, have different bents and, and, uh, and ways we like to see things, and sometimes just get plain too vocal about it. So what are the uh, accusations that Paul gets here? Error, okay, in verse, uh, verse 3. Our appeal, meaning sharing the gospel with you, did not come out of error or erroneous doctrine. You could put it that way. Uh, or impurity. Now, impurity would have been a, a uncleanness in thought or word or deed. It describes the moral state uh, of impurity uh, and leans toward um, sexual sin. Didn't have, a, didn't have an agenda with the lady folk, if you want to put it that way. He didn't. Or an attempt to deceive. That's that deliberate attempt to mislead other people. Think of this, a fishing lure. 
What, what is it for? It's to simulate a, a, a little fish or something that the fish might be interested in eating so you could catch it, snag it, and reel it in. Paul didn't have that in his mind at all. He came not as an attempt to deceive, but to tell the truth. And then it goes down into verse 5. And for we never came with words of flattery. Flattery, that smooth tongue speech that trying to make a, a, a favorable impression on somebody uh, so you can gain some kind of selfish advantage over them. Flattery. Well, there's a Danish proverb. Flatterers look like friends, just like wolves resemble dogs. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and that's the way it is. We need to be careful how we use our tongue. And Paul was being accused of, okay, I'm just going to make you guys feel good so I can get something out of you, and I'm really a wolf. That's, that's what he was being accused of. Then it says, a pretext for greed. Literally, that means to have more. That, I, I'm, not, I'm not content with what I have. I want what's yours. What's mine is mine. What's yours ought to be mine. So I'm going to find a way to get it. That's what they're accusing Paul of. And then, then we have verse 6, glory. Nor did we seek glory from people. That's fame. That's getting all the attention. That wasn't Paul's objective. God was using him. People could see that, but it wasn't for the purpose of, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm standing up front. You know, I got all the, I got, got all the answers for you. That wasn't where Paul's heart was. Remember, back in verse uh, 5 of chapter 1, you know what kind of people we proved to be. You saw it. Now, this is something that Paul endured. It is something that we may encounter in our ministries as we're serving People throwing those barbs at us. Oh, yeah. You know, you are in it for the money. You're in it for the attention. You just want to have, you know, and the list goes on. First of all, I'm going to say, if that's any of us saying that, don't. Be careful. Be careful what you say. You don't know what's going on in someone's heart. And you know what? We're all human, and we say stupid stuff, and we, we do dumb things, and we don't know even sometimes why we do things. Be careful. Show grace. Show grace with each other, because we're all, like Paul said in Ephesians 5, we're all children of the light trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, and we don't get it right. So grace, extend grace to one another through this. The second point we see here is that we need to be pure in our motives for ministry. Be pure in our motives. Look at verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... So we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. This is all about motive. We have been approved by God. That word approved there is like assay. You know, when, uh, I don't know if you've ever done any mining. I sure haven't. I've just heard about it. But you take the ore that that you dig up and you take it to the assay office and they test it to see the genuineness of that uh, rock. Is it, is it the true mineral? Is it really gold? Is it really something else? Or does it have all kinds of impurities that need to be uh, taken out of it? We have been approved. We've been tested by God. And notice at the end of the verse, it says, and God who tests our hearts. That's reflecting right back to it. God tests our hearts. He's checking our motives out of why we're in the ministry. And it's a good thing because you can't see my heart. 
I can't see your heart, but who can see the heart? Yeah, uh, that's why in, in Psalm 26, the writer says, prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. That's the prayer we need to be asking. Not about so-and-so, Lord, show them their heart. You know, it's, it's Lord, show me my heart. It's, it's where am I erring? Where, where do I have impurity? That's where it needs to be for all of us. Because we're all likely to fail. We're likely to have impure motives from time to time. So God, show me where I'm getting off base. And notice what it says there, that we have been, or Paul was entrusted with the gospel. He was given this gift of the gospel so that he would share that. And that's why he was focused, laser focused on sharing that every town he went to. That that was the thing that I need to do is share the gospel. And that's really what we're called to do, is share the gospel. Now, I will say this. I'm, I'm going to kind of throw in a side point. Do you realize we all have different gifts and abilities? You're not all called to be a pastor. You're not all called to be a worship leader, an evangelist. Uh, we're all, we all have different gifts that God has given to us. And we're going to work in different ways. And so we need to be good with that. We're very complementary. If all of my body was an elbow, I don't know how I'd walk. I don't know how I'd talk. No, God's put different parts of us together for different uh, purposes. What is your purpose? Have you ever asked the Lord, what is your gift? What is it that you're supposed to be doing? How are you to be serving the body? That's the question to ask. Uh, there is a time for coming in, sitting down, being part of the body, whether the church here, figuring out, is this the church you need to be at? But then there comes the time when God has solidified and said, now get to work. Now get to work. Mike and Karen Slotemaker, they sat in here for a year, soaking it up, asking the Lord, when, what should we be doing? Finally, God gave the green light. Now he's working with the men's ministry and they're having a, a, a growth group starting next week, this week, this week. Well, what a blessing that is. You get in, you figure out if this is where God wants you and then when he gives you that green light and you have to ask, ask God, what should I be doing? Don't just sit there and think there's gonna be a light that shines on you, you know, and like, like Paul and the road to Damascus. Oh, yes, Lord. Hey, ask God, explore. You know what? There's also some things of you, it, there may be a, a trial and error time, you know, where you try something, ooh, that didn't work. I don't have the gift to do that. Um, but God would show you eventually where you're to serve. But be pure in your motives. That's the thing. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Now, we are all entrusted with the gospel. Every single one of us. And that is what we're to bring and deliver to the world around us. Now, serving, we may serve the body and we're serving one another, but we are always serving the gospel to others. So the ministry, as we look at this uh, last couple of verses, the ministry's manner is tender. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother, 
taking care of our own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Notice the tone here. Notice the simile that he uses in verse 7. We were gentle. Why? Or how? Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Be gentle. That is the encouragement here. In your ministry, be gentle. Now, Paul was an apostle. He could have taken a very different tact and just told them what to do. You need to do this. You need to do that. You know, type A, uh, what is that, type A personality. You know, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. And, but it wasn't what was effective in the ministry. He was to be gentle like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And in your mind, you think about a nursing mom with a a newborn infant. The mother is very careful with that baby. Picking it up carefully, rocking it. And then when the baby starts crying, okay, i got to figure out why. And is it down there? Uh, No, there's no no messes down there. Uh, Baby's hungry. And so the mother nurses the baby very gently, very tenderly. It's not like throwing a hamburger at it. It's giving it what it needs at the moment. And that's how Paul was. Here's what you need at this moment to grow so that you can be healthy. And he uses a term here. It's very interesting. In verse 8, and being uh, affectionately desirous of you. My heart is just going out to you church at Thessalonica. You have become so important and dear to us. And so what did he do because of that? He was ready to share the gospel of God. Notice how important that is in Paul's mind. I can't say that enough. Primarily it was the gospel that he wanted to share, not social programs. It was the gospel. But also, he says, our own selves. He wanted to give of himself so that these people could survive, but also thrive. And you think about a a mother. And some of you have been, many of you in this room have been mothers, are mothers. And you've had those little children And when they cry, what's going on? When you don't hear them, what's going on? Your heart is bent toward that child for their nurturing. You don't get the sleep that you might have had. You hear the cry and you sacrifice yourself and out of love you get this done and that is the role of a servant, of a minister of the gospel to get it done so that you're healthy. But it's not just my job, it's our job as ministers of the gospel, as servants of the gospel. How can I care for others? And some of you have very different personalities and giftings and you're to employ that in this body so that we can all be healthy and to grow. What an encouraging word this is that we see this. So so we have to kind of ask ourselves, where are we in this process? Am I serving? Is it time for me to serve? The Lord wants to use you And even if you don't have an official ministry here at the church, do you have your ministry radar up, your little antenna? Because there are people in this room who need you to care for them, to pray with them, to bear their burdens. And it's it's a 24-7 thing, and that's when you're the healthiest spiritually. You're receiving from the Lord. You've connected with him. You're connecting with the body. You're growing in the word, and you're serving. And through serving, you're going to reach out. 
It's just the natural process. Genuine motives. Do we have genuine motives or selfish motives in our own ministries? Our prayer is that you would have the genuine motives. Ask God, reveal my heart. Reveal where I'm erring. And through love, serve one another. And that's when we're like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have placed us in ministries. We thank you for the example of Paul. Ministering to the church at Thessalonica, Lord, what an example he has been. Uh, Lord, through his challenges, through the resistance, through the persecution, but also through the victories. Lord, move in us in the same way that we would be bold to speak your gospel, speak your truth, to love others, that our hearts would be uh, desirously affectionate toward one another as a nursing mom. Oh, Lord, we long for that. And we say, Lord, lead us on. Lead us. Show us your ways. We'll follow. Open our eyes to see the path you have for each one of us. We would pray in Jesus' name. Amen.